Wherefore, O ye illumined youth, strive by night and by day to unravel the mysteries of the mind and spirit, and to grasp the secrets of the day of God. Inform yourselves of the evidences that the most great name hath donned. Open your lips in praise. Adduce convincing arguments and proofs. Lead those who thirst to the fountain of life. Grant ye true health to the ailing. Be ye apprentices of God. Be ye physicians directed by God and heal ye the sick among humankind. Bring those who have been excluded into the circle of intimate friends. Make the despairing to be filled with hope. Waken them that slumber. Make the heedless mindful. Abdul Baha. <clears throat> O ye, my soldiers of the kingdom, be ye valiant and fearless. Day by day, add to your spiritual victories. Be ye not disturbed by the constant assaults of the enemies. Attack ye like unto the roaring lions. Have no thought of yourselves, for the invisible armies of the kingdom are fighting on your side. Enter ye the battlefield with the confirmations of the Holy Spirit. Know ye of a certainty that the powers of the kingdom of Abha are with you. The hosts of the heaven of truth are with you. The cool breezes of the paradise of Abha are wafting over your heated brows. Not for a moment are ye alone. Not for a second are ye left to yourselves. The beauty of Abha is with you. The glorious God is with you. The king of kings is with you. Abdul Baha. Thank you so much. So now I'll introduce our speaker for today. And just a reminder to please save all your questions until after the talk when we'll have our Q&A session. And if you're new to the Baha'i Faith or if you'd like to be added to our mailing list, please fill out the Google form that we'll put in the chat below. Our speaker this week is Dr. John Woodall and his topic is, can religion and spirituality help teenagers become resilient from a Baha'i perspective? Dr. Woodall is a psychiatrist formerly on the faculty of Harvard Medical School with special expertise in post-traumatic stress disorder, resilience, and brain health. He was the director of the State Department refugee relief effort in the Balkans after the war there, and the convener of the Resilient Responses to Social Crisis Working Group at Harvard University. At the request of the Mayor's Office of New York City, he developed and implemented a citywide resilience building program for children after 9-11 that was also implemented in New Orleans and Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina and in Northern Uganda. Since the Newtown tragedy, he has launched a series of resilience building efforts there. He is a medical director of Synergy Health in Sandy Hook, where he specializes in brain health, treatment resistant depression and resilience. And with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Woodall. Well, thank you so much, Bayan, for that wonderful uh, uh, comment. And uh, Pemane and Bita, those are all perfect uh, quotes. Thank you so much for uh, uh, setting the tone in those beautiful songs. I, I have to tell you, I feel entirely inept uh, to speak about this topic. I'll tell you a quick story about Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, uh, a man came to him one day and said, uh, Bapu, can you teach me uh, how to quit smoking? And Gandhi said, yes, I can, uh, but you have to come back in a month. And uh, the man said, well, okay, I'll come back in a month. So 30 days went by, the man came back and said to Gandhi, well, I'm here, it's, I waited 30 days. Uh, can you teach me now how to quit smoking? And he said, yes, I can, I can teach you today. And then the man said, well, why did you make me wait 30 days? And Gandhi said, well, I had to quit smoking first. So I kind of feel that way that I'm, I'm speaking about resilience as if somehow I were an expert. You know, the truth of the matter is your experts in resilience as well. Your grandmother and your grandfather, your aunts and uncles, your parents are resilient. All of us have some forms of resilience. It's not something that just doctors and professors invented in the last 30 years. The story of humanity is the story of resilience. So we're in a conversation to help each other in our resilience. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what that path looks like. And I was asked specifically to talk about religion in this context. So this gives us a great opportunity to really talk about very 
important core issues that are sometimes difficult to talk about in a secular context. But I think we have uh, language that can bridge that gap that I'd like to kind of explore with you. It, I'd like to begin with a quote, another quote, and this is from a book called The Four Valleys, written by Baha'u'llah, and it's on page 58. I was asked to always give references. The quote is, love never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. Love never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. Love never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. Well, I think that quote is speaking to us right now, and I'd like to unpack that idea a little bit. We are living in fearsome times. This past week alone has unleashed uh, forces that are truly awe-inspiring in the worst way. These are, these are ominous times. And if you're not struck by fear in some ways, you're all probably not paying attention. These are difficult times. So a quote like that challenges us. Love is a light that never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. The story of religion really is the story of the unfoldment of love throughout civilization, both in individuals' lives and in the lives of communities whether it's the, 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 the story of how love unfolded in the, in the tribe of Abraham that then expanded in the 12 tribes in the, uh, in the Torah and the teachings of, the, of, uh, uh, the, um, of Moses, how that expanded into city-states and to love thy neighbor in the times of Jesus. But if Jesus said, love the Incas and the Buddhists, they would have said to him, yes, Lord, but what's an Inca? What's a Buddhist? Uh, so the, the human capacity to understand this message of love was limited, not by Jesus, but by humanity's limited understanding. So in the time of Muhammad, we have a greater outpouring of the understanding of what love means to encompass a nation or, or what we knew of nations at the time. And now we're in a time where we can finally see the oneness of the whole process. This is this unfolding story of love as humanity uh, uh, matures, that we're at the stage now that if we don't understand the nature of our oneness, more of what happened this last week is going to happen. The, 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 the spirit of the age, the lesson of the age, the truth of the age is that we are all one and that this love has to permeate and motivate the entire planet. This is the great challenge. So what does that have to do with resilience? I wanted to talk specifically to the youth. I know that there's a lot, there are a lot of adults on this call, but my take is, is that the youth are the pivotal people, uh, not just in this conversation, but on the planet right now. And you've heard this before. Well, I, if you haven't, I'll, I'll say it again. The, the world is in a tumult right now. It's in, a, it, the, it's in the throes of the death pangs of all the isms that divide us, racism, sexism, uh, nationalism, uh, classism, you name an ism, and those isms are, are tearing at the fabric of civilization, right? So anything that's based on that kind of thinking is collapsing right now and causing conflict. And what's arising simultaneously is a sensibility of our oneness and that we need to see each other as a human family. Baha'u'llah said, regard ye not one another as strangers. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. So we have this notion of moving into something new. So as these events happen, like this week, it's tremendously helpful to put it into a context that, that the, the turmoil we see is the, hopefully, the final lessons of learning that uh, unless we see our oneness, we're going to get more of that, that kind of week that we just had. We must direct our energies to building something new, something the world has never seen before. Unity on the largest scale 
that respects the diversity of each country, of each individual. This is going to be a delicate challenge to, to navigate. So our resilience in that process, being able to protect ourselves from the collapsing of one system and the birthing of another is the challenge of, the, of everyone alive on the planet right now. And the youth have to become masters of this. So that quote, love is a light that never shineth in a heart possessed by fear is the keystone. What I would like to suggest to the youth watching this is that more than anything, you need to become experts at love. Now, you wouldn't expect a Harvard professor to say something like that, but that's the truth. You need to become experts at love, right? It needs to permeate your thinking and everything about you to help redirect your motivations and your thinking. Now, Let's talk a little bit about the times we're in and, and fear. One of the things that I do uh, in my work uh, as a psychiatrist is I've worked with people who've had tremendously bad things happen to them, whether it's been in war, uh, uh, in natural disasters and genocides. And kind of bizarrely and ironically, my wife and I live and work in Newtown, Connecticut, where the terrible school shooting happened. Many of you will remember that. Some of the, the teenagers, you might have remembered that you were maybe 10, 11 when that happened. If you're younger, this is a horrible school shooting that happened right down the street um, where 26 individuals were killed, uh, 20 first graders. It was a horrific experience. So this is very personal for us as well. How do we find light in the middle of horrors like that? Or how do we see ourselves in the middle of this storm that's brewing in the world right now? And, and I want to begin actually by showing you this. Do you see what that is? Yeah, it's a lollipop, right? And I'm going to turn it around and I cut it in half. Now you see how it's got that chocolatey center in the middle, right? All right. I'm gonna describe you as a lollipop, all right, to make an example, okay? We are, are uh, as humans, we, we have brains and we have a brain that has three parts to it. It's got a stem, it's got a middle, and it's got an outer coating, right? Our brain is like that. We have a brain stem that we share with lizards and, and amphibians, uh, 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 reptiles. It's called the reptilian brain. And everything that happens in our life that's automatic is pretty much controlled by the brain stem. So our breathing, your heart rate, uh, your hormone balances, your body temperature, but also your response to threat, right? If someone attacks you or if you're on the you know, on the plains and a lion assaulted you, you know, your, your brain stem would protect you by setting off an alarm system called the fight or flight system. Maybe a lot of you have heard of that before, the fight or flight system. That's controlled by your brain stem. The brain stem controls everything that preserves life instinctually, right? That things you don't have to think about, right? So what happens if you don't mind, I'm gonna continue with this for a second to talk about resilience and love. I, I promise you we'll get there. So let's say you stepped into the street, uh, you're playing ball with your friends and you're paying attention to the game and, uh, and someone hits a ball into the street and you go running into the street without looking. And then suddenly you hear a car approaching you. You look up, there's the car. What happens? Immediately you startle like this and you jump out of the way, right? And the car goes by and your heart's pounding, you're breathing fast and you're, you're very afraid. That response is called the, the fight or flight response. Your body, as soon as you saw that car come at you, your brainstem released a flood of adrenaline into your body, right? And the, the adrenaline takes over everything right? Because you need to be completely focused on survival. You can't be thinking about the game anymore, right? So the, the, the control of your whole body is driven by your brain stem, right? And I, I, I promise I won't make this a Harvard lecture, but, I, 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 but uh, you know, if I start to see people falling asleep, I'll, I'll change topics. But, but uh, so the, this is really interesting though. So what happens is your brain is, your body is flooded with adrenaline. 
And just like that, in a hundredth of a second, your heartbeat speeds up, your, your, your breath gets uh, more rapid, your, your muscles tense, so that you can either fight the, um, the danger, like, like a lion attacking you, or you can flee, fight or flight. So you have to be ready for that, right? So the adrenaline makes you either ready to fight or flee, all right? So um, just like happens when, uh, when the car's coming at you and you jump out of the way, you flee, right? So now what happens in the next part of the brain, that, that uh, chewy nougat center part of your brain, the, the, the chocolatey part, what happens in that part of the brain? Well, once that adrenaline has taken over your body, it also takes over the middle part of your brain, right? The middle part of your brain is where your emotions and your memories are. Now, what two emotions would best help you fight or flee a, a, a scary situation? Fight or flight? Well, if you, if you needed to really be focused on fighting that lion, you better not be laughing, right? And you better not be bored and you better not be, uh, 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 you know, uh, I don't know, think of any other feeling. The best emotion for you if you have to fight a lion is anger, right? And rage even, right? So f anger is a survival emotion that's designed to help you fight a life-threatening uh, event. Make sense? So what would be the opposite emotion that would help you flee, the fight or flight? The emotion that would help you do that is fear, right? So these two emotions, it's more complicated than this, but the, for our purposes, the two survival emotions, it, when, we're, when we're threatened, our life is threatened, are anger and fear, right? And that's controlled by the middle part of your brain. Now, what happens in the outside of the, of the lollipop, right? In the hard candy part? Well, that's the cortex. That's the thinking part of your brain. It's cherry. So, uh, so what happens on the outer part of your brain? The outer part of your brain is also now controlled by adrenaline and it's directed to th look for threats, right? So everything you see looks like a lion or you're wondering, is there a lion behind that tree or uh, on the other side of that door? And you're either angry in preparation for it or afraid as a result. Right. So now, have you ever had the experience where, uh, well, uh, I'll back up a little bit. So now this mechanism of control is coming this way, right? From the brain stem to, the, to the, making your uh, adrenaline flow to your midbrain where your emotions are directed towards anger or fear. And then the outside of your brain where all you think about is things are threatening and you either need to be angry or afraid, right? Now, that's really, really helpful uh, when you're being attacked by a lion. It's really, really bad if you're trying to have a relationship, right? If you're trying to have friends, if you're trying to be in a family, if you're trying to be in a community, if you're a nation, if you're a, a, glo a global community, if everybody's in flight or, fight or flight mode, we're, we're done, right? because everything you perceive looks like a threat, right? So when people are angry and afraid, they tend to stay angry and afraid. Have you ever had the experience where you've gotten upset with somebody, you know, and then an hour later when you're not mad, you're like, ooh, boy, I totally got that wrong. They weren't saying something mean to me, they were just saying something, but because I was kind of defensive, I misperceived what they meant. Oh, boy, I gotta go apologize. Or have you ever been like um, uh, laughing hysterically with your friends and then every stupid thing is hilarious, right? And then an hour later, when you're trying to explain to somebody what you were laughing at, it just sounds dumb, you know? But, but when you're in that emotion, everything reinforces that emotion in your perceptions, right? So again, the control is going this way from, from the brain stem to the midbrain to the cortex, right? So what does this have to do with love and religion, for God's sakes, for God's sakes. Well, what is happening to us in, in the world is that we're in a chronic state of being controlled by our brain stems, our animal nature, our lower nature, 
our reptilian nature, right? So that means we're always reacting out of fear and anger, right? And so over time, that becomes very depressing. If, oh my God, everything is a threat out there. Why do I even want to be alive? I feel so alone. I feel so, you know, beleaguered is a word that means when you're, when you're being surrounded and, and attacked. If you feel that all the time, what life starts to get small, right? Life starts to get pretty meaningless or desperate, right? And so people either contract on themselves and become smaller, or they start being more aggressive, kind of like Wednesday, right? So we're in the middle of a world that's captivated by its brainstem, right? And set up to create more aggression and more fear and more anger, right? This is the huge challenge of our time, right? How do we reverse this trend from going from uh, being in fight or flight where we see everything either through anger or fear and then uh, uh, act towards each other with survival mechanisms instead of real cooperation, right? The purpose of religion, you could say, if God were a, a psychiatrist or a neuroanatomist, is to reverse that, to go the other way, to control, to calm down the midbrain so that you're not just responding with fear or anger, to widen the scope of your emotional life so you're not, you're not a prisoner to survival emotions, right? And a, two of them are anger and fear. Well, there's others, greed, you know, uh, there, there's others. So to not be controlled by those survival emotions and the brainstem. You know, in Newtown, after the crisis, we started something called uh, Peace Builders for the kids in town. And we talked about this. I didn't have a lollipop at the time, but we talked about the same thing. But we talked about how the stem is the, is the reptilian brain, the lizard brain. And one of our sayings was, uh, you're 11, you're 12, you know, you have extraordinary power to help change the world because you're not full of all these prejudices that adults seem to be carrying around that we're all suffering through. So the big challenge of life is to not be a lizard. So that's when it was one of our sayings, don't be a lizard. When bad things happen, watch that fear, watch that anger, because it's going to set you up for more conflict in your life. How do we go this way? How do we have the higher part of our brain control our life? And that's where love comes in. Love is a light that never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. You could also say anger, right? It's a quote from Baha'u'llah. So the real task is to enkindle a different pathway in the brain, right? A different thing, something else that controls us other than just sheer survival mode, right? Of, of, of the fight or flight response. What else can motivate us? What else can guide our thinking? The answer is love, right? In every form, right? And the story of religion is really, it's not a story of teachings or doctrines, really. Uh, it, it really is a, a story of the unfoldment of love in individuals' lives so that they can bring out those qualities that the outer part of your brain have that control your brainstem, your lizard brain. That's what religion is for, right? If it does anything else, if it's used to divide people against each other, then you got it wrong. It's better to do without it, right? It's much, much better to do without a religion that divides people because it's not what religion's for. Religion is for bringing out qualities. Now, here's the next neurological point. When we're born, that brainstem is working on overdrive because it's the most developed part of your brain right? When you're born. The outer cortex is, it's called the pluripotential, the pluripotentiality. It's got all sorts of potential, but very little actual capacity, very little actual skill, better word. 
So that's why we're, we're kind of born half baked. You know, we have to be fed, we have to be changed, we have to be nurtured, we have to be taught language. Other animals, you know, a giraffe is born and it just joins the herd, it's ready to go. Not humans. We need training and nurturing. And, and so, what happens when we're born, our, our brain stem is completely developed, right? And it's keeping us alive. We cry when we're hungry, we wriggle when we need to be held, or when we're wet, you know, and slowly, slowly, we're learning skills in our cortex, language, how to be kind to others, how to be cooperative, how to think abstract thoughts, you know, and then over time, what happens is this reverses, where our cortex is running the show, and our brainstem is becoming quieted, right? We learn to count to 10, you know, how many times does your parents say, you know, when you get angry, when you're a little kid, well, count to 10, go, go to your room, come back when you're calm. That is a training. It's training your cortex to quiet down. It's training your cortex to quiet down your brainstem. It's, a, it's not just a moral or ethical training. It's actually a neurological training where you're nurturing the, the, the cortex of your brain. Right. Now that's best facilitated through the emotion of love, right? It's not well facilitated through the emotion of shame or guilt or, uh, or the fear of uh, being punished. It's, it's best facilitated through, through love, the experience of love. Teenagers get this. Teenagers completely get this. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about than what, what we're really doing. Uh, Baha'u'llah said this in an amazing way. He, um, he said, uh, and this is in a book called Gleanings from the Writings of Baha'u'llah on page 260. He said, regard man as a mine, rich in gems of inestimable value. Now, what an interesting concept that we're a mine. It's that same idea that we have these potentials that are not evident when we're first born, but that they're developed over time. If you're standing on a mountainside and there's gems beneath, two feet beneath your feet, if you don't know they're there, you won't go digging for them, right? So one of the main tasks of religion is to tell you that there's gems right under your feet, right? And maybe really deep as well, right? So part of what religion does when it's done correctly is to tell us what our real nature is, that there are these gems within us. There's this capacity we have to control our lower nature and to feel other things than fear and anger, right? Or greed, right? There's more that we could feel, right? So the process of becoming spiritual or religious isn't so much about, uh, you know, learning doctrines. It's about bringing out gems, right? It's about mining the gems. Well, guess what? You don't have to go very far to, to mine those gems. You're, all the challenges of life are the digging, aren't they? Right? So it, it, it'll come to you, the digging, right? So one of the beautiful things in uh, Paimane's um, uh, quote that she read was that in the middle of those struggles, right, we tend to feel our, the most alone right? We tend to feel abandoned and forsaken, that the river of life is flowing by and somehow we're not in it, right? That we're alone and isolated and, and forsaken, right? This is a human tendency that's driven by that lower nature, right? And the quote that uh, Pemane read was saying, wait a minute, you're never alone, right? You're always being nurtured and brought and, and comforted, and there's always a pathway uh, to your own unfolding, Here's another example. You know, uh, I, in my practice uh, as a psychiatrist, you know, this issue of fear is 90% of what we talk about is why, you know, wh how it is that people come to feel so isolated and broken and fearful. Um, and an analogy came to mind the other day about, you know, it's almost as if you were in this dark entryway to a huge, huge house and the lights were off and, and you didn't know that right through that door is this huge house, right? And that all you need to do is, is 
turn the light on and start exploring. But we tend to feel very isolated. So you're, you're like, it's like you're sitting in the vestibule of a huge mansion. And, uh, and what religion is doing is saying, wait a minute, you have more than just this vestibule. You got this big mansion. It's got a, it's got a gym. It's got an indoor swimming pool. It's got a library. It's got a solarium. It's got a garden. And, you know, it's got all these playrooms and interesting, you know, uh, 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 um, rooms. And it's also connected to other people's houses. So the, the process of, of unfolding our resilience is the process of discovering those gems in us, those rooms in this mansion within us, right? The, this capacity within us. So, all right. All right. Now, I wanted to talk about a condition for this process of discovery. So if we have that first quote, that love is a light that never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. How do we approach love, right? So if you can imagine as a teen, right? If you, let's say you're in love with someone and you said to them, I love you. Right? Do you think they'd feel that they really, that you really love them? Or you, you, don't, you don't speak about love like it's homework, right? You don't speak about love like it's a task. You speak about love like it's consuming you, like, like it's your gateway into the beauty and wonder of life, right? You, you feel love as if your whole life has been cracked open and, 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 uh, and life is pouring through you, right? So when we approach religion, when we approach it like doctrines, we're killing it. We're, we're, we're killing the very thing that is our, the, could be the source of our liberation. The, the, one of the interesting things about all the religions is there are texts and documents and, and traditions that show us how to bring out these gems, how to bring out this resilience. And uh, in, in, if it's the Bible or the Torah or the Quran or the, or the Baha'i writings or the Bhagavad Gita, these, if you approach these texts, one finds that it's an instruction manual on how to bring out the gems. It's an instruction manual on how to quiet the fear and the anger and kindle love so that you have a way through life struggles that is other than fear and anger, right? So that this potentiality, this love digs out and brings out those gems, right? So love is the key. Love is the key. Now, how do you approach love? with all your heart, right? So there's another quote of, of Baha'u'llah from the Persian Hidden Words, number 19. He says, approach me not with lifeless hearts. That's like God speaking. Approach me not with lifeless hearts. It's like a, to a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You don't say, mm, I love you. No, it's like, I love you. It's, it, you're, 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 in, you're enkindled with love, right? That process of enkindling causes your midbrain to go to just completely open up, right? Suddenly potentiality is opened up in your cortex. There's, it's a neurological fact. Love opens up neural networks in the cortex that were previously not open, right? You're capable of thinking things you never thought before. You're capable of experiencing the world in ways you never, it never occurred to you before, right? Because it, well, because it was potential. It, love is the tool that opens up our capacity. It's what opens up our resilient capacity. Now, we're coming up on time and then I'll, and I'll, I'll be quiet in just a minute. That, that's a hard thing for me to be quiet once I've started talking. Now, over a lifetime, the better we get at kindling this fire of love in our own lives, the more we see over time, we develop that perceptual capacity, this outer part of our brain, where we're, we're able to see it all the time or much more frequently so that we can refer to it in difficulties, right? So we can, we can step back from the fear and the anger and go, okay, I, I know I've got this. I, here's this familiar place in my heart that I know that I can go back to. 
So even though things are really scary out here, thank God I'm, everything's okay right here. That process evolves over a lifetime. The sooner you begin cultivating that, the better your life will be, right? Right. So there, if, if the process begins today, perfect. Start today. Begin kindling a fire of love in the heart that can replace the fear and the anger of the brainstem, right, with something better so that in the midst of trials and difficulties, you become more of who you are and not less. It really is that simple, right? Cultivating that over time in the Baha'i writings, it's referred to in a number of, of ways, the, the result of that cultivation. It, in some places, it's called assurance. In other places, it's called certitude. And in every religion of the world, there are examples of the heroes and martyrs of the different religions who, because of this sense of certitude and this sense of assurance, Daniel's in the lion's den and he, he's not injured, or Paul in the midst of the fire is not, uh, not injured by the fire. Uh, uh, you know, the Haji Akund in the Baha'i uh, history, these, these people just in the, in the 1800s who survived horrific torture with a complete calm in their hearts. Seems impossible. But these were living examples in, the, in, the, in, in recent history that show us this is possible for us to develop that heart of certitude that has been cultivated through the practice of love, through allowing love to uh, direct our lives. Now, I, 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 there's a lot to talk about, about resilience. But since this was a conversation about resilience and spirituality and the, and the Baha'i faith, but really all the whole religious uh, uh, process, I thought we really need to start with the core element, which is love. Um, and uh, I encourage you to um, approach the writings of any of the world's religions, not like homework, or not like um, you know some task or some doctrinal obligation, but to approach them with passion, with with a deep thirst to to have that love enkindled in you, and something different happens. Something happens when you approach these writings in that way. Uh, it feeds the heart. Sometimes in mysterious ways, we find ourselves stirred. Parts of our, that house we were talking about, suddenly lights go on in rooms of our inner being that we didn't know were there, right? That's what we want. We want the struggles of life to be opening us up and not closing us down. Now, I'll, I'll end with, with this, and then we can speak together. Um, the more you do this now, the more you'll be prepared for the headwinds that are ahead of us. Uh, soon. Right? The world is in great danger right now. It's also on, on the verge of witnessing some of the most beautiful examples of loving unity that we've ever seen, that the world has ever seen. Your generation as young people is to be the midwives of that process, is to facilitate it and never be disheartened it, just as that beautiful quote that uh, Pemane wrote uh, read in the beginning, maybe we'll have you read it again to close when we're done, is that we are not alone, that there are, there are lordly po powers, there are divine forces even that are working to support this birthing, right? So in, in the midst of your deepest trials, be assured that the power of love will guide you. Be assured that the power of love will guide you. Be assured that the power of love will guide you. Love never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. Okay. All right. I think we'll close there. Pemani, could you read that quote again, please? Sure. O ye my soldiers of the kingdom, be ye valiant and fearless. Day by day, add to your spiritual victories. Be ye not disturbed by the constant assaults of the enemies. Attack ye like unto the roaring lions. Have no thought of yourselves, for the invisible armies of the kingdom are fighting on your side. 
Enter ye the battlefield with the confirmations of the Holy Spirit. Know ye of a certainty that the powers of the kingdom of Abha are with you. The hosts of the heaven of truth are with you. The cool breezes of the paradise of Abha are wafting over your heated brows. Not for a moment are ye alone. Not for a second are ye left to yourselves. The beauty of Abha is with you. The glorious God is with you. The King of Kings is with you. Abdul Baha. Thank you, Pimani. Just one last comment on that. The, the, the battle he's talking about isn't physical fighting. It's the battle within us. And it's the, it's the withstanding of the negativity, the, the fear and the anger, the, uh, and withstanding it with love. That's what he's referring to. All right, friends, thank you so much. And I apologize for going a little over, but I'm, I'm anxious to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Woodall. It was so interesting. I never really thought how like religion, spirituality, and like neuroscience, those kinds of things come together. It was really interesting to hear your perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, now we can have a, a Q&A portion. So if you have a question, you can put it in the chat and I will read it out loud for you. So um, it looks like we have a question from Pamana and she asks, does the skill of emotional regulation arise from cultivating small practical habits or can it only be achieved by addressing deeper issues and wounds within a person? And how does spirituality and religion aid this process? It's a, it's a, it's a critical question. It, it's, a, it is, it's a fundamental question. Um, both, uh, it's, at, it's both. Um, the, 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 here's the issue. When love isn't kindled in the heart, the, we have no motivation to do that, to, to kindle those skills. The, what, what we kindle, what we pursue instead are defenses uh, from being assaulted, right? So we use psychological uh, mechanisms, psychological defenses to, that are based on anger or fear right? We avoid certain sorts of people or we only interact with people in certain ways because of a fear we have that somehow we'll be degraded or, or undermined or disrespected in some way, right? So we, we have either angry or, or, um, or fearful uh, uh, psychological habits that we develop, right? So the nature of transforming that one is not motivated to try to transform that if one isn't motivated by love. One is, in, one is motivated to maintain those uh, defenses, right? So we have people whose marriages dissolve because uh, one spouse can't help but seeing the other person's comments as being offensive, right? Or as being attacks or as being uh, degrading. And so the person who's doing the degrading doesn't see they're being degrading. They see, they're being, they're, they see that they're being defensive, right? Or offensive to, to against some attack they're perceiving, right? So uh, it, these vicious cycles of offense and defense uh, are perpetuated until a different motivation takes over. And the only motivation is love. That's the only one that changes that, 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 uh, that uh, momentum. Now, that love can start with the love of a child that a couple, let's say, chooses to work on themselves because they both love their child, or they both remember aspects of their early relationship that they caused them to fall in love. So love is what motivates the, the, the desire to re-examine those habits of thinking, those habits of feeling, and those habits of emotion. And that emerges over a lifetime in small ways, in you know, little things you do, little choices you make during the day, as well as in big crises. There are manifest, Abdu'l-Baha refers to them as manifest and hidden tests, right? Things that are really obvious, right? Like what happened in Washington, and then there's all the subtle ones like, well, how am I going to emotionally respond to this? You know, how do I now relate to my brother who, who you know, um, thinks completely opposite that I do from, you know, in political terms. So those little choices are the day-to-day -day, uh, mining of the gems, right? And we're all caught up in that right now. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Glory, and they ask, 
When talking to a stranger, whether online or in person, how do you know the line between being open and loving and having that line of caution from fear of safety? But it's, it's such an important uh, question because so much of our life now is um, confined to being isolated and uh, our interaction is online, right? And it's so unnatural, isn't it? You can't look in the person's eyes. You can't share a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a meal together. And so it's a kind of, it's sort of a setup for superficiality, right? And it's also kind of a setup for um, uh, offense and, and being offended and uh, uh, being kind of shallow in conversations. So I think social media really, really sets us up to be more angry and more afraid. I think first knowing that is helpful, that, that our world, even though so much of it now is online, that really isn't who we are. That really isn't uh, uh, what uh, the best of humanity is necessarily. So there's this crazy kind of balance we're all trying to maintain bet between trying to maintain connection with people, but also try not to be manipulated by social media, which really is designed not to facilitate the bringing out of your gems. Social media is designed to sell you stuff, right? So that every, you, know, you, you we've all had the experience. You mentioned to someone, oh, I like um, chocolate bunnies, right? <laughs> and then the next thing you know, you're on Facebook and then you're getting advertisements for chocolate bunnies, right? So it's it, it, the whole thing is designed to sell you things. It's not designed to bring out your best qualities. So, uh, uh, I, I, I have to discipline myself uh, a lot these days to just stay out of certain conversations, I, I, especially ones I feel really angry about, which are a lot, just to stay out of them, just to stay out. It, it's, I don't wanna feed the beast. I don't wanna feed my brainstem. I, I want control back on my brain, right? I don't want, I don't want my brainstem controlling me anymore. I, 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 you know, I, 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 I've, I've explored some of the, the rest of my brain and I like it better than my brainstem. I, my, I don't like me in, in my brainstem. I'm not a nice person when I'm down there. So I like the other parts of me. So it's really, we really gotta be careful now because we're just being bombarded with negativity. Thank you. Our next question is from Fereshte and she says, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. When you mentioned love, um, especially love expressed to others or ourselves as well, especially under this kind of circumstances, what does the Baha'i faith teach about self-love and appreciation? Love is a mystery, isn't it? Because the more you think about love, the more you think about, uh, boy, it's kind of like asking me to explain the Encyclopedia Britannica or to explain the whole internet, because it's, it's a huge question, <laughs> but it's, it's a critically important one. Um, ask me it again. A ask me it again. Let me see if I can focus a little more. Um, so it says, what does the Baha'i faith teach about self-love and appreciation, um, especially how you mentioned uh, love expressed to others and to ourselves under these kinds of circumstances? Yeah. So uh, here's, a, here's a, a great story that I, I re has really helped me. Uh, um, Abdul Baha, who is one of the founders of the Baha'i faith, one of the three central figures, uh, he once told a little story. He said, that, and I'm paraphrasing it, please forgive me for paraphrasing. He said, um, you know, people are like plants. They're like tender shoots that come up from the ground after receiving the, the warmth of the, of the rays of the sun. And, and they, it, they, they become stronger and direct their their uh, buds towards the, the, the warmth and the nurturance of, this, of the rays of the sun. And then over time, the rays of the sun help this plant to grow and to put out branches and leaves. And with the, as the sun continues to pour its bounties on the plant, it produces fruit. So some people are like plants. He said, some people are like the rays of the sun. So, I think we're all, we're both. 
because uh, I know in my life, sometimes I'm the plant and I need the rays of the sun that my wife gives me, for instance, because she's uh, my best friend. And so I, God's grace comes to me through my wife, right? And then other times it's the other way around. Uh, something's happened and maybe I'm helping her out. So we're both, we're both. Now, that's one element of an answer. The other element is that there's at least, just for simple, simple terms, there's at least two parts to our nature as human. Remember, there's the brainstem part of us, right? And we could say that's the small s self, right? Right. It's the it's the survival self. It's the part that needs to be um, it, uh, that is looking to acquire things to stay alive. Right. Then there's the capital S self, which is the the self that really mm, is potential. It's something we discover over time as we grow in maturity and as we grow in the expressions of love that are unique to us. Right. The 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 special version of love that we are. Uh, destined to, to bring into the world. All of us brings out a special version of the light of love, right? And we have a unique gift in some way, right? So that's the capital S self. So in one way, we need to help this brainstem feel calm enough so it calms down, right? So that's the kind of love where we give to someone else to help them feel safe, to help them feel nurtured and, tr and, and and that the world is a place you can trust and, and that you can be nurtured in, right? But the larger self is the self that doesn't want any attention to itself. It only wants to be the light. It, it, it has no real interest in the self at all. It, all it has, all it's interested in is the light, right? So we have these two natures, right? So on one answer, self-love of the, of the small s uh, uh, self can trap us in wanting the world to be about us, right? So that's the trap of the small s, is that it's the one that wants to acquire for the self it, without regard to, to others. But the paradox is that self also needs the love and respect of others to feel confident enough to let go of the brainstem survival motivations to move into the larger self. So it's a paradox, it's a little of both. So self-love, if it means, look at me, aren't I great? Mm, mm, that might be better than feeling you're a horrible person, but it's, you know, it, it's, it may be some kind of first step uh, that you stop beating yourself up or stop, you know, uh, feeling horrible about yourself. But, um, but it's, it's a way station, you know. Ultimately, love is asking us to let go of concepts of ourself, to become more, right? Until we actually, what we want, like a parent, a mother or a father, when you're really into being a mother and a father, you're not thinking about yourself. And it, it, you're only thinking about finding ways to nurture your child. Right? So love brings us to the place of sacrifice, of a lower station for a higher station. Love asks us to let go of our small self brainstem to become the a hard candy, um, uh, selfless servant. Right? It's a mystery, isn't it? So actually, we find ourselves in love by forgetting ourselves. That's the mystery. Thank you. Our next question comes from Wilmer and uh, they ask, are you aware of the work of Bruce Lipton PhD and Dr. Joe Dispenza? Is your work aligned to their research about the subconscious and conscious mind? Well, no, I'm, I'm not specifically aware of theirs. I'd be happy to learn more, but uh, the, uh, the subconscious is, you know, that's, that's an old concept. It, 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 uh, it goes back, you know, um, at, at least 150 years, but, but I'd be interested to know more. I know Robert J. Lipton, but yeah, I think you said Lipton. Um, but no, I'm not aware. But the, again, the concept of the unconscious is is kind of a foundational to all of psychiatry. Yeah. Our next question comes from Armin, and she asks, "How and when did you become a Baha'i?" <laughs> I grew up in Wilmette, Illinois, where the House of Worship is, and. Uh, 
uh, my grandfather helped build it. And my, his brothers and sisters worked for Corinne True, who was one of the main forces in building it. But I grew up a Catholic. None of my family were Baha'is. And I have to tell you, since we're speaking of resilience, <clears throat> I was 16 years old, <clears throat> very, very, very much a Christian and trying to find out what God wanted for me in my life. I'd had a wonderful spiritual experience when I was about 15. And I just really wanted to know what God wanted for me. And I just didn't feel like I was getting any guidance so that, uh, you know, you gave me this wonderful experience, God. Now, what do you want me to do, right? And I remember this feeling so um, uh, abandoned by God that I must have done something wrong because I gave me this wonderful experience. And now, now I don't know, I'm not, I don't know what to do with it. So I must have done something wrong. Maybe I'm, Maybe I'm not worthy of this, or maybe I'm, maybe uh, God, like, you know, just dialed to another station and isn't interested in me anymore. So I, I was really perplexed and, and deeply burdened by the idea that I didn't know what God's will was for me. I, I didn't know how love was supposed to play out in my life, right? And I found most of what people were talking about was just stupid, irrelevant, and didn't feed me. I think a lot of that's true for a lot of teenagers. They look bored. They're not bored. It's just that we're not feeding their hearts, right? They're, 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 they're waiting for someone to tell them that their heart can be on fire, right? With love, right? And, and that there's a mission for their life, right? And so they're, they're bored because people are just trying to sell them stuff all the time. And, and they, well, anyway, that, that's another story. I got off track. So what happened was one day my friends and I really at a point where I was really desperate. I thought if I don't figure out what I'm doing here and what this love thing is all about, I don't even know if it's worth being here anymore, right? Because it, it's like, here's this wonderful gift and oh, I'm gonna take it away from you now. So I, I was perplexed. So one night some friends of mine said, well, why don't we go to the Baja? Because I was in Womet, the, so the Baha'i, temple. We didn't even know how to pronounce it. We thought it was the Baja. Let's go down to the Baja. So we went down to the Baja and uh, we were sitting in the foundation hall area. And, and, and that, this is 1972. And so there was a slideshow being played. And uh, my friends, we were 16. So they were doing things 16 year olds do. They were like hitting the, the, the chairs that made this echoing sound and they were laughing and, you know, and I was in turmoil thinking, man, I, I gotta just find an answer. I don't know what to do. I, God really has to help me because I don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, just like that, I had this thought in my head that sort of came to me like, don't worry, have faith. Just, you'll be guided. Just take a step and you'll be guided. So it was like a big weight came over off my shoulders. And I thought, yeah, I, I just have to have faith. I've been caught up in fear and I got to let that go and just have faith. I'll, let's see what guidance looks like. Maybe I'll be guided. So I said, well, let's see what Baha is. So I walked out into the foundation hall where there were these displays and there were things I didn't really understand, something about kings and rulers, and I didn't get all that. But there was this one display that had um, the sun, and it said God in the sun. And then out of the ray, then out of the sun came these rays, and each of the rays landed on a little quote with a name underneath it. And it turns out they were quotes from all the different religions. So there was a quote from the Bhagavad Gita. There was a quote from, you know, uh, Deuteronomy. And there was a quote from, uh, uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. And there was a quote from the Quran uh, about how, the, the, and, the, and from the, uh, the, uh, the Buddhist texts. And they were all about how the founders of that religion said they weren't the first one to come and that someone else was coming. And they all said the same thing. And I thought, whoa. And then the last two names were names I'd never seen before. There was a, one was the Bab, B-A-B, and then the other one was Baha'u'llah, and I'd never seen these names before. And the quote from Baha'u'llah was that, this is the day in which mankind can behold the face and hear the voice of the promised one. Well, here was lined up all these religions saying they're not the first and they're not the last, but someone will come who will bring it all together. 
And here was Baha'u'llah saying that was him. Well, I can't explain it, but I got hit in the forehead by a lightning bolt. And it just, all of a sudden, it just appeared, uh, occurred to me that, oh my God, there's only one God. There isn't like a different God for all the religions. They're all part of the same love story. And now is the time for us to come together as one. And it just hit me. Um, and uh, I was kind of put into an altered state. I, I, I don't even know how I got home that night, but I, I knew in the core of my being that this was true. So I would just walk to the house of worship and I bought a couple of books. Never occurred to me to talk to anybody. And I would read these writings that were like water on a dry sponge. And they just healed me and nurtured me and gave me this orientation. Remember like that house where the lights were off? Suddenly lights started going on inside me like, oh, I don't have to be afraid. I'm not lonely. I'm not abandoned. All these wonderful gems started stirring within me. Never occurred to me to meet a Baha'i. Never occurred to me. Then one day, five months later, I was at the house of worship in was down in the basement and a woman was giving a tour and I joined the tour and someone asked a question and she would answer and then someone would ask a question and I would answer and then you know and then we the tour ended these people left and she says oh well uh, uh, uh and the Baha'is have a, a greeting they use it's Allahu Apa and she said that to me and I didn't know what that was so I didn't answer and so she said well uh, uh, are you a Baha'i I said yeah I have a Baha'i. She says, oh, well, where do, you, where do you live? I said, well, here in Wilmette. Well, she was from Wilmette. And she's like, you are? <laughs> she said, well, are you, do you, how long have you been a Baha'i? I said, well, about five months, something like that. And she said, oh, well, have you declared your belief in Baha'i? I said, yeah, I think so. I don't know. What's declared? What is that? She said, well, hang on a second. She showed me this card and it said, if you believe these things, you're a Baha'i. And I said, well, I already believe all that stuff. She said, well, if you sign it, you're a Baha'i. I said, well, no, I'm already, I believe that. Why, do, why does signing a card have to do any of it? She said, well, the, she said, the point is that there's a community of Baha'is. And, and you'll, if you sign this, then it's like letting people know that you want to be a part of a Baha'i community. I thought, oh. And it's the first time it ever occurred to me that there could be a community of people who thought these things or that there might be value to that. So anyway. Um, if I could just say one, I know this is getting long, but uh, the, the next day was the, uh, an important day for Baha'is. It was the birth of one of the founders of the Baha'i faith, the Bab. And uh, so the next day I skipped school and I was so excited. I went to the house of worship and the same lady was guiding upstairs in Foundation Hall. And she, she didn't say, John, why aren't you in school? She said, oh, John, good to see you. So, so she facilitated my delinquency. So anyway, I, I came in and she, uh, she was reading this big green book. And I, she said, oh, well, good to see you. How are you? Oh, I'm good. So I said, well, what's that? What's that book? She says, oh, this is the Dawnbreakers. Do you know about the Dawnbreakers? I said, no, I don't know anything about the Dawnbreakers. She said, do you know about the Bob? And I said, well, he came before Baha'u'llah, but that's about all I know. She said, oh, well, let me tell you. So she, the rest of the afternoon, she told me one story about the Bob after another. And about an hour into this, I just broke out crying. And she said, well, are you okay? What's wrong? Why are you crying? And I said, I think I made a big mistake. I don't know what to do. She said, well, why are you, well, what? What did you do? And I said, well, I want to be a Babi, but I'm a Baha'i. So how do you, how can I be both? Do I have to be a Babi first and then be a Baha'i? Or how do you do this? She said, no, it's okay. If you're a Baha'i, you're a, you're a Babi also. So anyway, that's how I became a Baha'i. And I have to say that I don't really feel like I'm a Baha'i because I feel like it's way bigger than anything I understand. Uh, I've been a Baha I've been in the community for 48 years and I feel more um, odd and uh, than when it first started. If anything, I, I, if, if my being a Baha'i meant anything, it's that my gratitude has increased more uh, since that day. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Brendan and he asks, I've seen some people express their concern that academia and science is becoming increasingly distorted for partisan political reasons. 
As a former faculty member, have you seen this happen? Uh, it probably would depend on the, on the discipline. Um, you know, I'm a doctor, so uh, less so in medicine and at medical schools. So, uh, but some people are hired at universities because they're partisan. Um, and they're, 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 they're there to uh, elucidate a partisan position, right? So that happens all the time, yeah. Um, uh, what, what the, the reason I was invited to Harvard was because we were trying to do the opposite. We were trying to think, we, we were, this was in the early days of conflict resolution, that science in the late, late 80s, early 90s. And we were trying to figure out, is there another way to communicate and to explore the truth or what is true without taking sides or without having to be conflictual? Is there a way to have ideas clash and not people, right? Is there a way to preserve some sort of unity and even expand our unity by letting ideas clash and not people? So that, that was what brought me to Harvard. So as much as the university can be a, a hotbed of division, there's wonderful things going on in a lot of universities now where, where people, especially the young people, are really trying to carve out new, new ways of being that maybe have never existed on the planet before. So I think as a young person, um, if you're not finding your career path right now, it might be because it doesn't exist and you have to invent it, right? There may be, the world may need a new way of doing something that's just stirring in your heart right now as a yearning that hasn't been defined yet, right? It's really a cool, it's a terrifying and really cool position to be in. Thank you. Our next question is from Aaron and he asks, so as a psychologist, would you diagnose the disturbances in society as in their core based on the fight or flight response that it's been strongly reinforced on nearly all sides? Well, yes, I would. I, I would say that it's that lower nature that, that uh, the brainstem is uh, uh, causing. Uh, the nature of my work was how the fight or flight response in an individual then projects into society, right? What, what then happens when groups of people then are all afraid or all angry, right? How, what, how does that affect their sense of identity? You know, so how, how is it that groups then make enemies out of other people, right? And, and choose to fight as opposed to find other ways to, to resolve conflict. That was, that's the nature of my, of my work. So uh, the, the bottom line is, yes, I, I think this is critical. And uh, <laughs> this is critical. And uh, 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 we need um, uh, much more science uh, in how to quiet the brainstem, right? And, and how to bring out these higher aspects of human nature. We're doomed if we don't. So uh, absolutely, this is one of the critical, and you don't have to be a, a, a psychiatrist, I'm a psychiatrist. You don't have to be a psychiatrist or psychologist or academic. In fact, it might be better if you're not, but it, uh, especially a teen, getting going, getting that process going now in your life will only protect you and will only bring you happiness um, and, and success. It's a critical, uh, uh, life task. Thank you. Maybe the life task. Our next question comes from Sharzad and they ask, what is the best approach to direct the anger and fear in others to love? Uh, the, the first task is to quiet your own fear and anger. Yeah. Uh, your experience will, will prove that. Uh, think of the last time you were angry at someone and they were angry at you and you tried to convince each other of your opinion. Did it work? It doesn't work. As long as you're in an angry or fearful state, you're not interested in persuasion or being persuaded. You're interested in defending yourself because you feel assaulted, right? You feel attacked. So you're responding with fear or anger, right? Those are, so you, it's not about learning at that point. It's about defense. Right. So uh, as long as you feel anger or fear, you're not in a learning mode. You're in a dominance mode. 
you're trying to prevail, right? Dual Baha refers to this in the um, Tablets of the Divine Plan. He says it's the struggle for survival. And he says it's only through the love of God that we break this, this evolutionary drive of the fight for survival to come to the higher parts of our nature. Abdul Baha says this. I didn't make any of this stuff up. Abdul Baha is a neuroscientist in 1916 writing about this in the Tablets of the Divine Plan. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Our next question is from Patricia, and she asks, how do we swim in the social media and digital environments, nurturing our real desire to unite and love people? I, I think it's extremely difficult. Uh, venues like this are important. Um, uh, and we all feel how limited they are uh, yet still, right? You know, in this room that I'm in right now, this is my home, we would have 30, 50 people here every weekend, right? And now not having that, so we're grieving that we can't have our friends here. It's very difficult. Um, but remember, the social, th there's a great program that came out, The Social Dilemma. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a documentary about social media. Facebook, for instance, just as an example, it's designed to sell you things. It's, it, it's designed to see, you know, you like that, you've made a comment on that, you posted that. So they start to see, well, this is a 45 year old person. That's a 17 year old person who likes, you know, puppies and uh, you know, this kind of soda and what, and then once they know that they sell your, who you are to advertisers. That's why as soon as you, th you post something about, whatever it is, boom, like within in seconds, you get ads about that. That's how they, that's their business model. So it's not about bringing out your best qualities. It's about selling you things. And in our materialistic culture, that's the motive of social media, right? So we don't really have, we have to almost skate around it and be very conscious about how do we use a, a media platform like this so that we're, we're not consumed by it. Really important point is that a materialistic culture, its purpose is to tell you, to sell you things. This is a fundamental principle of advertising. You have to be shown that you don't have something. You have to be shown that you're inadequate in some way, right? Your, your, your beard isn't quite right, your hair isn't quite right, but here's a product that can fix that, right? So it's all about telling you how you're inadequate so that you can be sold something, right? So that's how marketing works, right? Tell somebody that they don't have something and tell them what the answer is. So what is the effect on this after being online for hours, being told constantly that you don't have something and here's something that you should buy, right? After a while, you feel overwhelmed. You feel like you don't know how to prioritize things because you've, you've had to make hundreds of decisions a minute about whether or not something is something you want to buy or not. And it's exhausting. It, cause, it, it causes emotional and mental fatigue. It causes anxiety because each of these ads uh, over time is perceived as a threat because humans perceive uh, confusion as a threat. So if we're being asked to make a decision about 30 ads in a minute, we start to feel anxious because each of those choices that we haven't resolved results in anxiety. It, it, it's, I don't know how we're gonna get out of this. I think it's a real problem, but shutting the darn thing off, uh, you know, at night is, is, is you know, at least part of it. I could go on, I, I, in my, I teach a course on resilience online for parents of teens, and I spent two modules on this because uh, I think it's, it's um, uh, really undermining our, our, our well-being. Thank you. Our next question comes from Keely, and she asks, I'm a high school teacher working with grade um, 10 and 11 students. I teach English in Canada, uh, we are concerned with truth and reconciliation in the mm -hmm. curriculum to address the genocide that occurred in Canada. Students are interested in how and what to do to be anti-racist and understand how to one, interpret what is happening, and two, what needs to happen to build new systems. How would you describe the twin processes of disintegration and integration in a way that helps them see hope? Oh, 
that's a huge question. And thank you so much for your important work. And I actually think literature is the way to go. Literature and the arts are critical to this discussion. Um, so uh, uh, this is where a teen mind can really begin to exercise the critical capacity for self-reflection, right? And that you, without that ability to self-reflect, you can't begin to perceive what parts of your responses are fight or flight responses, right? Because once you're angry, you join forces with other people who are angry and you become a group, right? Right, and, and now there's an us and a them, right? So anger creates us, them thinking. So does fear, right? We're afraid of you, right? So we're this group and we're good and you're bad. That thinking is at the, is at the core of everything destructive in the world. Right, so um, uh, so there's there are a few things, and why talking about love is important because it, it, even if you are angry or afraid, and we all get angry or afraid, if you at least have a reference point, an internal reference point where you've felt love before, where you've felt uh, a, an encompassing kind of embrace, if if you know what that feels like, you at least have a a, a guiding direction where you know, well, all right, I'm angry now, but I know I got to get back there, right? If you don't even have that, we're, we're, we're in big trouble. So that's why cultivating that capacity for love and seeing our common humanity on many levels, on a theoretical level, on a philosophical basis, but also as an indwelling assurance and, a, and something you bear witness to and, and humbly and joyfully acknowledge, you know, that's a lifelong process that needs to be nurtured. There are three skills that I think are essential based on that. The first is, is that ability to see unities when other people are seeing divisions, right? So how do you perceive a human picture when all the tendencies, when people are aggrieved, and oppressed, the, 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 the perceptual lens is to see differences, only differences, right? We need to see differences, but how do we create a context for seeing the differences that's trust, that's safe and not accusatory and not blaming and not uh, riddled with anger and fear, right? And this is tough because oppression will cause us to feel anger and fear. So how do we find a context that can moderate that so that other people don't see your fear as a threat or your anger as a threat, right? So that's the, that's the challenge in creating unities is that we see each other's fear and anger as personal threats and then you become uh, fearful or angry and keep the cycle going. So that's one. The second is the ability to perceive reality as it is and to observe your own bias. This is critical, it's critical thinking skill. Baha'u'llah refers to it as ansaf or, the, or fair mindedness. It's translated into English as justice uh, sometimes. Fair mindedness, justice, adil ansaf. Uh, the ability to be fair minded, to see things for what they really are. Now, remember when you're angry or afraid your anger and fear become a perceptual lens, right? And so everything you perceive now comes through that perceptual lens and colors it and gives it meaning. For instance, when you're angry at someone, everything they say or do makes you more angry at them, right? You, there you go again, there's that thing you're doing again. And then an hour later, when you're not angry, you're like, oh God, I totally misread that. You know, and then you realize that because you were angry, you misperceived reality. Same with fear, right? Or if you're in love, right? everything the person who, that you're in love with does something, it's like, oh my God, no one has ever picked up a pen like that before. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen, right? And then once you're angry at them, it's like, oh, I, I'm not given my pen. They can't have my pen, right? right? So the, our feelings become a perceptual lens. We're laughing with our friends, like I said before, then every stupid thing someone says is the most hilarious thing you've ever heard. An hour later, when you're not laughing, it's just stupid, right? So emotions become perceptual lens, lenses, and then those become meaning contexts, right? And so now everything that this group does is um, treason, right? Everything this group does is evil. They hate America, 
right? Everything that, right? We're seeing it right now, right? So the ability to, to, to reflect on what you th think and, and, to, and to divest it of the emotional overload so that you see things for what they are is, is fundamental to individual and, and group growth. We cannot grow as a species unless individuals cultivate the best beloved of all things, which is ansaf, the ability to see fairly without emotions of at least anger and fear. Then you can go on with greed and avarice and all these other things. So, and then the third thing, the ability to communicate in ways that facilitate unity and fair-mindedness, right? Because you can have those as motives, but then if you use your language in ways that are mm, uh, 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 offensive, right? Uh, or that reinforce division, you're, you're undermining the capacity of, the, of you and others to grow in unity and fair-mindedness. So consultative skills, the, the, the ability to speak uh, using your language skillfully to facilitate an exploration of unity, right? Because just believing in unity doesn't create unity. It's an exploration in the middle of a conflict. It's the, an exploration in the middle of a difficulty about how do we sustain what's common to us in the midst of these great differences. That's, that's the, the skill. You need, you need very specific communication skills to be able to do that effectively. So these three areas, the ability to maintain a sense of unity when all the psychological forces are, are causing us to be in camps of anger and fear, right? And reactionary to each other, number one, huge, huge task. Second, the ability to quiet anger and fear so that we can perceive things for what they are and not what our biases tell us, right? And, and our biases are things that, w ways we think that preserve our little identity, right? So that we don't feel assaulted, right? So to be, to be able to quiet that requires a sense of trust and safety that we feel we're not gonna be assaulted if we, if we open our mind up to a new idea. Right. And then again, the third idea is the communication skills that facilitate the other two to create new, a, a, a new solution that isn't just one idea dominating another, right? And, but actually creating something that's bigger that includes everyone. These are, these are lifelong skills to acquire. If you're a teenager, it's get started. There's a great quote of Baha'u'llah. It's in the compilation of, on consultation. It's at the bottom of the second page. That I can, that's as good as I can get. It says, um, no man attaineth his true station save through his justice, his ansaf, his ability to see things fairly. There is no power save through unity. And there is no well-being or contentment without consultation. These three ideas. Thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna close just with one last question in the interest of time. So our last question is from Amir and he asks, thank you for a very interesting talk. When we are guided completely by love, is there a worry that the leaders of a faith will exploit this openness and trust? Well, love isn't naive and love isn't blind and love isn't uh, without um, uh, discipline and form, you know, sometimes uh, as a loving parent, you have to tell your child to stop doing something and you have to enforce something for their own good. So it doesn't, doesn't mean being soft uh, only. Uh, it means never losing sight of our higher nature. It means never lo losing sight to how we all stand before the creator as uh, the children of, of in one family. Right. So that might mean sometimes having to be even stern, right? So, but yeah, being naive and, and having a notion of love is only an emotional um, uh, softness. Uh, uh, that would be a problem. Yeah. Uh, so let me let me take the the question a little deeper because I think this is what they're getting at. If you're trying to be loving to someone and they just want to manipulate you. Uh, you know, are you being foolish by trying to be loving? It's an important question. I, I, would, I would suggest that, uh, uh, again, love isn't only 
uh, uh, passive forgiveness. Right? It, it is that sometimes, but it's many things. And again, it, what it really, what it, it, it encompasses all virtue, right? So it means that sometimes you have to be honest and trustworthy. Here, here's an example. Um, sometimes love means saying something that's extremely difficult when you're afraid, right? So when you are being oppressed, to say to the oppressor, you're oppressing, right? That's a loving act, right? So the, 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 the pro, and I know this is, this is a huge talk right here. Uh, every virtue you can think of is a uh, part of the spectrum of love. They're all, if you, if you like put love through a prism, it, it divides into all the various virtues, right? Now, the interesting thing is every virtue has its opposite, right? So we're, ad, we're advised to be patient but we're also supposed to be assertive and not passive and, and you know, get our life going. We're supposed to be uh, humble, but we're not supposed to be cowardly, right? So every virtue you can think of has its opposite, right? And every situation in life will present us with a tension between opposite virtues that we need to kind of navigate situation by situation. So being lovingly kind might, uh, be uh, important with a, a child who's just made a mistake and we need to kind of help them so they don't become demoralized. But being lovingly firm might be necessary when they're a teenager and they took the car out at, at night with, and they don't have a driver's license and they almost killed somebody, right? So, so, so there's tensions between virtues that have to be navigated situation by situation. And what guides that process is a sense of our indwelling gems, our indwelling dignity, our indwelling capacity. So a respect for that process and a, and a desire to increase unity, as we just said, increase our sense of seeing things with justice or fairly and communicating in a way that allows for the possibility of those other two. Those are the guiding principles. Thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Woodall. I think we all really enjoyed it. And then the questions afterwards kind of deepened all of our understandings. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for this. And uh, I'm anxious to learn from all of you. And I'll, I'll, I'll be tuning in next time to learn from who you, whoever you have next. So thank you so much. And please keep this up. Thank you. So um, our speaker next week will be Dr. Kendall Williams. And his topic will be why I believe in God from a Baha'i perspective. And again, these talks occur every Saturday at noon Eastern Standard Time, so please invite your friends and family. And if you're new to the Baha'i Faith, or if you'd like to be added to our mailing list, please fill out the Google form that we'll put in the chat below. And now we're just going to close with the Baha'i Prayer for America set to music.
so much. We'll see you all next Saturday. Bye.